Hello and welcome to the Ark Woman podcast. This is an exploration of womankind. Here we discuss what it is to be a woman in the modern world while utilizing ancient and modern modalities in tandem to create a bounty of health for the body, mind and spirit. G'day everyone and welcome back to the Ark Woman podcast. I'm your host, Sarah, the woman behind Ark Woman. Thanks for being here. Before we get into this incredible conversation with Moira Bradfield, all about vaginal microbiome health, dysbiosis and everything in between, I would like you just to have a moment to listen to me talk about our amazing sponsors. The first of which, if you're watching this on YouTube, which I think you should, because there's going to be lots of diagrams about what Moira and I are going to be talking about. If you do watch it, you will be seeing me sitting on this incredible Drift Surf Co rug. It's made out of 100% recycled cotton. It's, it's designed in Australia by Annie and then they are ethically made in Bali. They have incredible designs and the women behind it are just as beautiful and inspiring. Annie likes to design these rugs as she meditates. She is a practicing Buddhist. So the love that you feel in these rugs into their design, how they're made, the ethics behind that, and even how proceeds for this goes into One Day Org, which helps women get transfer themselves into their own lives after having experiences with domestic abuse or just having a hard time in their lives. Jodie and Annette are the women behind this organization and Drift Surf Co. And they've given you a discount code for any rug or yoga mat that you would so desire to have in your life. It is Aquaman 10 and you can get that at driftsurfco.org. I'm also sitting here drinking amazing cacao from Creation Cacao. It's organic, non-GMO, high in fat and minerals. So if you're addicted to caffeine like I used to be, this is an incredible alternative for you. This is really high in fat and minerals, as I said before, which means you're going to be able to capture all of the minerals and suck them up into your body and actually make use with them. Caffeine isn't so good for women's systems all the time and coffee is, you know, not so good for your liver either. So it makes you know, makes for some acne and some PMS and possibly some more cramping. So we want to stay away from that. So a good alternative is ceremonial cacao. It gives you a really beautiful lift and you can see as I'm interviewing Moira today, you can just see that I'm becoming more and more enlivened and it's because I'm drinking more and more cacao. And so if you go to creationcacao.com.au and you use my discount code ARCWOMAN10, you'll get 10% off any order. Today, I'm interviewing Moira Bradfield. She has a PhD in vaginal microbiome health, and she is amazing. She is really great at mixing together the allopathic, which is our modern medical system, and the alternative together for a best treatment option. She isn't one to say that a copper IUD is 100% evil in all cases. She is going to tell you about the nuance of why it may or may not be good. So in this conversation, you're not going to find anything that is going to tell you exactly Exactly what's happening in your microbiome because there is so much diversity in what healthy looks like for vaginal microbiomes of all females on the planet. It really takes a lot of good listening and if you can please sit down and watch this episode because I'm going to put up lots of infographics and diagrams for what we're talking about because the microbiome is quite complex when we talk about it. I don't think it needs to be. So if you have the time in your day please sit down and really concentrate on what Moira is explaining because 95% of what comes out of her mouth is gold and the other 5% is silver and bronze and it's just gorgeous. I absolutely love her and her work. You can find her at intermedicology.com.au. She's not taking any clients from Canada and the US at the moment, but she is taking on new practitioners. So if you want to work with her and you're in the US and Canada, just wait and you'll be able to work with one of her practitioners really soon. If you're in Australia or anywhere else in the world, she's taking you on. Her books are open on the, I think it's the 21st of March, she said. So you can find her there. Please sit down and enjoy this conversation that we had together. She is absolutely fantastic. So your pathway into researching genital microbiome is quite intriguing. This is not something a path I think a lot of women will travel through, let alone men, let alone anyone. So could you walk through what inspired you to explore this field and how you became specialized in it? Yeah, it was uh, a combination of factors, I think. Um, one of them being a clinician and being in clinical practice, I had a year where I saw a lot of weird and wonderful vaginal discharge and applying what I knew at that time in terms of naturopathic and holistic principles, I wasn't seeing the change that I thought 
I should change, see. So essentially I then went, oh, what, what do I not know? And went into a little bit of a research rabbit hole, you know, just looking at information and, and studies and realised this was a whole area where I hadn't been exposed to in my education and therefore most people hadn't. And it was something I think at that time we'd started talking about the gut microbiome, but no one was really talking about the vaginal microbiome in and how that relates to people and their presentations in a clinical setting. And so, yeah, it sort of kick-started from there. I mean, I have my own personal experiences, but at that time they had already been resolved in that in my in my 20s I had a lot of urinary tract infections and I think when I look back retrospectively had someone had this information to supply to me I wouldn't have had that journey and that frustration and uh you know because we have this information that's available to us that can really change lives and break cycles of recurrence that and sometimes it's very basic information that we're missing, you know, in terms around lifestyle and contraceptives and things like that. And at other times it's very ingrained into systemic health that we need to make those connections as well. Mm. Okay. And I think that is really interesting as well because I'm only just finding out about, out about the vaginal microbiome now. And so when did you start your research in this? Like when did you, did you start your PhD in, was it, is it um, recurrent vaginal back, like, recurrent bacterial vaginosis or did you study before that and you were like oh like I really want to get into this there's not enough studies in this or like you just were interested for your clients as well or like what was that like for you yeah so the um I completed my PhD in 2023 and it was a four-year journey so prior to that and uh I had been in clinic working and educating fellow practitioners with disinformation as well prior to that but I went into a PhD knowing that I wanted to focus in on the vaginal microbiome because it was this area where, particularly in a holistic setting, there were lots of missing factors. I think for a very long time we've had research that's explored infections and the relationship to antimicrobials in a pharmaceutical setting but not in a holistic and herbal setting. And so I went into finding a supervisor and what that looked at and then we had the option to essentially pick whatever condition I wanted to pick. And one of the most frustrating things clinically to work with is recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. Yes. And that's because people can experience these, you know, flares of symptoms monthly and or sometimes continuously for years. Like people can have it for 10, 20 years. And, and pharmaceutically there are things that are available, but they are essentially you have to be on those and then you stay on those things. And so I thought, well, let's pick the trickiest thing, the most frustrating thing. <laughs> clinically and see if I can make a dent in that you know bring some perspective to it and so I ended up working with a, a wonderful supervisor and we we you know worked out a beautiful project at that time pre-COVID and um oh. and started started a PhD which was essentially a clinical trial on people who had recurrent vulvo vaginal candidiasis with a, a intravaginal application but then looking at their microbiomes but with COVID that all changed but the project became much better than it was initially anyway. Oh, wow. so it was a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> a blessing. Okay, so given the unique focus on your research, did you feel at the time that this was a specialised field or there was an abundance of research? Like you said before, like we don't have that much research on how we can holistically heal these things. So is that what you study, like how you can use different things like sea buckthorn and a few of the other things that you've been speaking to me about and how we can use that in clinic instead of just throwing antimicrobials and antibacterials on things? Yeah, I mean, there is there is research. Like I think in all microbiome health, there's been an explosion of information around it. What we are missing, like we have a lot of data around trends of, of the microbiome, what bacteria there is, what fungus there is, and what they're doing and how they're interacting with each other. And then we have uh, a less but still there research around interventions um, and as I said mainly pharmaceutical although there are teams all around the world working on what is the impact of this particular herb on this particular micro um, and for me as a clinician who even though that type of research is very important for our understanding as a clinician we're still thinking about who is this person sitting in front of me and why have they ended up here and what is the what can I work with systemically and holistically to improve this situation whilst also using that information which is very local and symptomatic to help and support them to move to a better place in health as well. So with my research, 
um, we used a very specific formulated intravaginal that was had already some evidence, but not enough, but also some very big links into traditional health. So, for example, the intravaginal utilised acetic acid, which comes from vinegar, yeah. and um, used lactic acid, which is there is research on lactic acid and bacterial conditions in the vaginal microbiome, but nothing on a fungal setting, which is where we were situated. And we looked at that, but in in the in the study as well, we also spoke to people and about their experience of diagnosis and their experience of interactions with healthcare professionals, which is exceedingly disappointing for mm. these people how they access yeah. care and how they're treated clinically. Um, and we also then looked at individual, uh, you know, did a lot of literature review and then looked at information around the microbiome and how it changes with standard medication as well because there's a, a lot of lacking information about what happens if you're on a medication like fluconazole long term what happens to your microbiomes is that a positive thing or a negative thing um so it, it sort of took on this bigger more holistic setting as well in the research and at the core of that for me is there's these are people who i see in clinic that i want to help and so i need to keep that in a context where somebody can pick up my research and go oh this is how I apply it to an individual. Well, these are the factors. So in, in when I'm writing a review, I'm always mentioning that this it can be hormonal and it can be immune-based and it can be you know, associated with partners. And all of those things are important as well for us to really keep in perspective. And that's what I really love about you and your work so much is because have you heard that saying that when you get a PhD, you, you know a whole lot about nothing? <laughs> but with your research, you seem to know a whole lot about everything to do with the vaginal microbiome. You have a holistic view and it's very refreshing because very often with research it's very very specialized and with you you've gone okay no let's look at the whole picture because there's so much that plays into this and especially with the female body because we have all of our hormones we change through our entire lives but before we delve a little bit deeper into this can you please explain to us what the microbiome is and what the vaginal microbiome is because there's probably people listening to this who are listening to all of these words and saying i I don't even understand what this is. I didn't even know my vagina had a microbiome. So could you please give us a little bit of an intro into that? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, you're right. Lots of people are probably not aware or maybe they've heard about the gut microbiome but not aware that there are so many different niches and, uh, and orifices essentially in our body that also carry microbes or bacteria and fungus and viruses that live with us synergistically hopefully most of the time um, and and provide us with benefits as well whether they are immune based mm -hmm. or um, nutritional and things like that so we our microbiome side essentially is where those bacteria fungi and viruses hang out and when we're talking about the vagina microbiome it's specific to the vaginal canal so from the vaginal opening up to the cervix there is a microbial community that we can look at in a, a, a whole lens that we know is a big part of its immune defense so this is a part of our anatomy that interacts with the external world but also deals with internal things coming out in terms of um, babies and blood and uh, and so with that there has to be some sort of immune protection that is associated with that and when we look at the vaginal microbiome it's a very unique microbiome site in that it has some characteristics that we don't find in any other microbiome site and we don't necessarily find in any other species. Mm -hmm. So the with the vaginal microbiome, a, a well-touted hallmark of health in the vagina is to have a lot of lactobacillus bacteria. And so this means that you could have a microbiome that is entirely made up of one type of lactobacillus or 75% of one yeah. type of lactobacillus. And, and, you know, when we translate that into other microbiome sites, we're often going the more bacteria, the different types, the better, that's the healthier, you get more complete protection. They all do different things and produce different things. Whereas the inverse for that on the, on the vagina is that we have this really hopefully robust colony or something that's producing very protective uh, chemicals that uh, maintain an acidity within the vagina and protect against invading pathogens or things that might be introduced to the space through sex or intercourse and uh, are responsible for maintaining the immunity in that area. So it's a really wonderful thing that holds and, and you know, changes your lifespan and changes with hormonal patterns and is very heavily influenced by our estrogen status. So if we have uh, estrogen that is fluctuating as it should if you're menstruating or that is sitting there at good levels at different points in the menstrual cycle, then that's uh, directly related to having 
hopefully a, a higher amount of protective bacteria, which for many people is lactobacillus, although there are always exceptions to that. And that's what really surprised me when I learned in your session I went to, you were like, yep, we don't want any diversity at all. I used to be a, a, a professional kombucha brewer. And so I know a fair bit about the gut microbiome. I know a lot about acetic acid and the lactic acid. I know about these things. And that gobsmacked me. And I couldn't believe that was the first time I'd heard that we want about 75 to even 100% dominance of one one species, which is, is it predominantly lactobacillus? And I know there is diversity with different races of women. And that's my, that's another question I want to touch on later. But first, I'd like to ask how we get colonized with this bacterium. Is it from our mothers when we're coming out of the womb? And like, what are the implications for C-section births and things like this? And is there a correlation with women having, um, you know, problems with, the, with their pH, problems with their vaginal microbiome if they have a C-section birth or if the microbiome of their mothers was a little bit um, dysbiotic as well? Yeah, I, I mean, the, those are all factors. Like any microbiome in our body is influenced by our external environment and our genetics. And, you know, there's so many different things that shape what it is. And so when we are in utero, there is a hormonal stimulus that is generally a lot of estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't necessarily matter how you birth, although birthing through the vaginal canal has a lot of documented benefits on the gut microbiome and seemingly would have an influence on the vaginal microbiome as well. Okay. Um, but because we have had that influence of estrogen stimulus in utero, babies when they are born have a continuing, it, it drops off after a few weeks, but there is this sort of heightened estrogen that circulates. So sometimes oh. when we see um, female babies that are born a few a, they may have a show of blood when that estrogen drops off. It's almost like a, a, a small menstrual bleed, although it's wow. not that. Um, and that can mean also when we see that estrogen drop off that at that time in children, the microbiome is generally not lactobacillus dominated. And it's quite healthy to have a mix of different types of bacteria like aerobic and anaerobic bacteria or things like E. coli and streptococcus. Um, those things can be completely normal and healthy at that stage of life. So we don't have necessarily a lot of lactobacillus why we don't have fluctuating hormones. And that tends to start coming on or coming back online for us as we approach puberty. So we know that prior to the first men up, um, somebody with a vagina will start to see lactobacillus colonies emerge again. So they may have always been there at a very low level. Um, they can be obtained from environment and, and diet as well to a certain degree. And But there are certain events that happen in a lifetime that allow things to colonize and stay versus things that are you know, transitory and come and go mm -hmm. as well. And so birth is an event and genetics is an event and hormones and hormonal exposures. And then uh, as people become, you know, sexually active, there are also different exposures that can happen there that can lead us to being colonised by different bacteria. So mm -hmm. sometimes, and challenges like environmental challenges that stimulate our own bacteria and um, fungi to respond and change in different ways as well mm. so the only constant with the female vaginal microbiome is change <laughs> it's the only constant because when you're so what you're saying is when you're born you're going through menarche then your cycling years then perimenopause then menopause your microbiome changes across your lifetime as well is that what you're suggesting because our hormonal status changes through this time as well yeah, it's intrinsically linked to particularly lactobacillus because we're looking at fuel for these bacteria and that comes from uh, a cellular expression of glycogen which is directly related the density of the cells in the vagina and how robust they are is related to the estrogen cycle and so yeah we see change across a lifespan and then we see change across a lunar cycle or a menstrual cycle as well so we have these fluctuations and the fluctuations in a menstrual cycle are more subtle if things are doing well and quite healthy but they are there and they are documented and then over a lifespan because of the fact that we can move into periods where estrogen doesn't you know have the highs that it once does or never did if we're looking at premenarch um then th th that will be a very different microbiome to what somebody might see through uh, menstrual years or through uh, pregnancy um, and even postpartum we see because there's a a prolactin if people are breastfeeding there's prolactin highs and estrogen lows and so that can become more diverse and more like uh, a menopausal microbiome 
It's so beautiful. It's like so beautifully designed. Like the more you think about it, you're like, yeah, it makes total sense for lactobacillus to become more dominant when estrogen is higher because that's going to be creating a more acidic environment because that's an immune response because this is when you're going to be having sex. That's so interesting. It's so fascinating and beautiful. I can't wrap my head around that. Wow. Um, could you please speak to a, a little bit because I know that women after this, they might go and Google, okay, like what, what does a healthy microbiome look like? But I know that there is a bit of genetic diversity attached to race. And like, could you speak to that? Like, what are the common denominators you say you see with like Caucasian women, Asian women, um, Native American women, and like what would be their quote unquote healthy um, vaginal uh, microbiome diversity or, or lack of diversity? What does that look like? Yeah, it, it, there are differences. There's difference in any race or ethnicity. And, and when we talk about this general it's a generalization that lactobacillus is the goal and everyone has to have it, otherwise you have ill health. It's not true. And so in the very early research, it's a really beautiful study from Jacques Ravel's team in 2011, and they were the first to characterize the vaginal microbiome in a larger cohort. And they took healthy people from a range of different ethnicities and they saw different patterns emerging in terms of the percentages of people that would sit into quite specific lactobacillus groups or the percentage of people that might have a more diverse microbiome that wasn't lactobacillus dominated and what we see is that it's it's okay some people do don't have lactobacillus dominance and in the absence of symptoms and and as long as people are experiencing good health that is completely normal okay. as well Great. and so there is a microbiome subtype it's called cst4 community state subtype 4 and that that is well known that it's more diverse there's less lactobacillus if it's there at all. And it can be dominated by other types of bacteria that sometimes we might flag as being more problematic. Um, but it can be for that, per for that person very normal and included in that community state type. Other things like people will have um, bifidobacterium dominance or people might have a bacteria called corneobacterium or gardnerella or streptococcus. It's all very normal. But what they found and what's been replicated since uh, in, in Ravel's original, original study is that in different ethnicities there was a higher percentage of people that might have um, lactobacillus dominated associated with like crispatus, which is considered to be like the ha oh, king of the lactobacillus versus the people that might have a more diverse and for people that have um ethnic backgrounds or uh, who are you know not caucasian essentially there is sometimes higher tendencies to have more diverse and they think that might be a very uh, something that's been shaped culturally and genetically there are very big differences in what goes on in, in terms of our heritage and lineage and practices as well um, but it is considered to be very normal and i think that that's a really important message for people because we do now have a abil ability to go and get our vaginal microbiome tested mm. and if you're only looking at microbes on a page and being told that there's something wrong here because you don't have lactobacillus, then we run into problems of people trying to obtain, you know, a, this thing that is unobtainable because it may not be genetically what their blueprint is like at all. Um, or, you know, in the absence of symptoms, it may just be reflective of their stage of life and that could be completely normal mm -hmm. as well. Okay. It's about understanding the blueprint, <laughs> the small print underneath, I think. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's important, though, that we do understand that blueprint and do understand that when we talk about the microbiome, of course, there is going to be diversity in different women, but we shouldn't have diversity within our microbiome. Does that make sense? Am I saying that right? Like, so say if I have a dominant, I don't have dominant lactobacillus, but I am not showing any symptoms negatively in microbiome health and it's not affecting my life, then that's completely normal. Do you think that we need more research to fill this in and to make this a little bit more obvious or is this well known within the scientific community so far? Pretty accepted in the scientific community because of the fact that we have these community state type categorizations. But I think that when, even when you read that literature, because four out of five of those community state types are lactobacillus dominated, it's very easy to write a sentence that says lactobacillus is considered to be the hallmark of health because it is considered to be the hallmark of health with this really big exception for this subset of people who don't have lactobacillus and are healthy. 
So if you're one of those five women and you go and have your like microbiome tested and your your doctor freaks out because you don't have a dominance in lactobacillus but you don't have any symptoms, it's okay. Like you're completely healthy and this is completely normal. Yeah, definitely. And I think that comes back to you have to understand hormonally where you are and are you having symptoms? And I mean, I would always clinically, because I tend to be testing people that have issues, obviously when I see a more diverse microbiome, there's a lot that we need to work through. But sometimes when we're working with people, if we see a resolution of symptoms and a move towards health and the microbiome is not reflecting that, then we need to reassess what is a healthy goal for that individual okay. as well. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's a very important thing to flag because there's, I see a lot of misinformation and, um, and I'm always trying to correct that in my education as well. But depending on the type of testing or what you're using as your hallmark of health, it can be misinterpreted. And, yeah, people feel bad about it and go about doing all these things when, in fact, they just needed someone to say, do you have symptoms? No. Is everything okay? Okay. Do we have anything that's really pathogenic, problematic and shouldn't be there? No? Okay. Well, then maybe you're okay and, and go forth that from there. Yeah. Yeah. Nuance is never very sexy. That's for sure. Like <laughs> you always have to kind of use the hook and then be like, but there's heaps of nuance to it. And very often people don't understand that scientific nuance. And I feel like very often uh, you know, females are a little bit, I, I don't know, the science is just catching up for us in our body. And I feel generally that females are a little bit suspect of science in some ways. Um, so it's nice to see your work and how you're bridging the gap between the allopathic and the alternative and saying, look, no, there is nuance. Yes, this is complex, but it is not hard to understand. I think that's really beautiful. Um, can you please speak into, you just touched on it just before, the immunity aspect of a healthy vaginal microbiome and how a you know a high diversity or a dysbiosis in the vaginal microbiome might you know decreases the immunity in that space and how it might be more susceptible to microorganism overgrowth so things like candida thrush or even stis and things like this as well yeah totally um so yeah when we think about again i'm going to generalize if we have a lot of lactobacillus or bacteria that are capable of producing very specific chemicals that are immunoprotectants. So lactobacillus, for example, are well known to produce lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And both of those things contribute to the acidity of the environment, which in itself is a very basic but important uh, defense mechanism against anything that's introduced into the environment. If it can't survive at a particular acidity, then it's going to be decreased and the lactobacillus persist and maintain the environment. Mm -hmm. They're also beneficial bacteria in this space are also capable of producing other complex proteins outside of those two forms of acids and um, they are called bacteriocins and they're very strong antimicrobial metabolites that are produced by bacteria as well so we have that aspect of it and and through interactions then there is recruitment of your own immune system into that area there's obviously blood supply and there's cellular defense mechanisms as well but it's a very synergistic relationship between our microbes and the immune system in that area because it does interact with the external world i mean most of well, all of the sites where we see a microbiome there is an external world interaction yeah. you know, be it food or be it penises or tongues or whatever is going on <laughs> there's the capability to introduce uh you know, or have access of other bacteria into that space. And so it needs to be able to um, meet that demand as well. But there are circumstances where those bacteria shift and change. And with disorder comes further disorder. So if we see a movement away from a regulated pH and a dominance of bacteria that are able to maintain the environment, then we can see this pH shift encourages the growth of other bacteria that are normally kept in check at a certain acidity and so they have an opportunity to increase as well and so this becomes more diverse we get different acids being produced within the environment that means there's higher amounts of cellular inflammation there can be higher amounts of cell damage yeah. um, with anything that's introduced then there's a higher risk of a, a bacteria or a pathogen or a fungus being able to opportunistically it, use that environmental circumstances to its own great again essentially so we see overgrowth of you know infective organisms and with more disorder and trends towards things like bacterial vaginosis we see an increased risk of sdi acquisition or those things concurrently occurring at the same time 
as well. Um, and candida is is frustrating and unique, and that's why it's my area of study. But it can it exist and take opportunity in an environment that is disordered, but also it can be problematic in an, an environment that is considered on a bacterial level to be quite balanced and you know perfect. So there there are other nuances that are very specific to the bacteria or the fungus themselves in terms of their pathogenicity or their resistance traits or how likely they are to take advantage of an environmental shift that gains them an opportunity to grow because they're just mm. living things that want to survive and they're responding to environments. There's no, no malice in it. No. As as <laughs> it's like, oh, it's, I'm going to party. It does not feel that but, way sometimes. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. So, uh, you know, it is when it's working well, it's an amazing immune system that is to our benefit. But as things move away from that homeostasis of balance, then our risks of different infections increase and, um, you know, and things become riskier to interact with the external world as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering that so eloquently. So going from that, how can our vaginal microbiome change with other conditions like endometriosis and PCOS? Do we see any literature and any general themes that we see with women with these hormonal, hormonally driven disorders? Yeah, so again, there's a direct link to hormones and what that means. Um, there is literature examining both of those conditions. There's not abundant literature, like it's still in its infancy. Um, there is a lot of obviously focus these days particularly on endometriosis and what's going on but they tend to be looking at um, gut and vagina microbiome alongside each other but because of the population itself there are complexities in terms of how they've been treated or what they're managing it with is that hormonal in nature what is the degree or staging of your endo etc but uh, in a nutshell because there is a hormonal link associated with it, then the flow on effects of that are what does that do to a microbiome or what sort of circumstances that does that put on the microbiome that may change it. So if we look at something like PCOS where we have this androgen excess, so we have less estrogen, there's changes that occur on a cellular level, less fuel available perhaps for beneficial bacteria, but there's also changes that happen to things like cervical mucus in, mm -hmm. in, in its elasticity or how much of it they might be as well, which can create a completely different environment that might be more favourable to a more diverse and a more disordered environment as well. So in PCOS, there is literature that tells us they have more diversity in their microbiome and they're more likely to perhaps have quite specific bacteria like urea plasma present, which wow. can further add to an environmental inflammation for some people and to levels of disorder as well. So this hormonal link is very important. In if you're working with somebody with PCOS, obviously you're working at a hormonal level as well and with that you may see improvements of what goes on on their vagina microbiome or less discharge because a lot of the time that discharge is interpreted as being thrush which may not be true either you know it's more voluminous and it's wide and it's thicker but that's for me I see that as being part of a PCOS potentially a urea plasma situation which candida will take advantage of but it doesn't always it's not always there and in that situation um with endometriosis we've got this opposite situation where there are potentially relative relative excesses of estrogen in relationship to other hormones intertwined with a whole lot of inflammation and multi-system impacts as yep. well. And at the core of it with endometriosis, again, the literature tells us that there are hallmarks of imbalance or dysbiosis with the vaginal microbiome, um, differences to the cervical microbiome and even the endometrial, so the uterine microbiome that can occur in these individuals. But that is a consequence perhaps of not just hormones but inflammatory markers, um, you know, genetic traits and an immune system disorder as well. Mm -hmm. And then on a very physical level, you know, just the frequency of bleeding or the amount of bleeding or, you know, the challenge itself of heaviness in a menstrual bleed means that there's a period of time that someone who doesn't have endometriosis may experience four days of bleeding that tapers off on the last few days versus you know, five, seven days of very heavy bleeding. Like that's a significant pH challenge as well for that environment. So we have these multiple influences coming in on the microbiome that are both hormonal and situational in terms of physical effects of those hormonal disturbances. Mm -hmm. 
Could you please touch on a little bit more of the specifics of what clinically you would usually see women with PCOS and women with endometriosis? I know endometriosis might be a little bit more tricky because it's such a complex disorder. Whereas PCOS, we have more literature on it. We know it is hormonally driven. We know it's excess estrogen on excess androgens and excess um, insulin as well. So what would usually, if a woman had PCOS, what should she be looking out for in her vaginal microbiome just to keep an eye on it and vice versa for endometriosis? Yeah, I mean, for anybody that has a vagina, you need to just be looking for changes that aren't your norm and things that uh, have, are associated with discomfort, whether that is an odour association or a, a, the volume of discharge or an in, inflammation or irritation or an excoriation. Those are the things that tell us there's a, a microbial overgrowth that is out of the realms of normal um but there are lots of subtleties in that spectrum of what can go wrong as well like if we've got this constant hormonal androgen stimulus it doesn't mean that there is an estrogen under there i mean these people are still cycling and there are still you know there is still a rhythm to it even if it is not what we would consider to be associated with somebody that doesn't have pcos so we still can see microbiomes that have beneficial bacteria but there tends to be more tendency to uh, disorders. I mentioned for PCOS, for me clinically, I see a lot of thick discharge that they've been told there's nothing wrong with. Like, you know, that's and in every cultural test, that's a very normal discharge. Or it could be candida sometimes as well because of the, um, the insulin issues and what we see with blood glucose control. There is a higher risk of some forms of candida associated with that as well. And, you know, at, and that can move into, I mean, BV I see a lot of with PCOS as well, but it doesn't always present as classic BV or bacterial vaginosis in that it doesn't have a superficial odour. You know, sometimes it's more about what we're seeing microbially when we actually, you know, look at it on that level. And, again, that's because of where the testosterone or the androgens are and where the estrogen isn't at that time as well. Okay. All right, so that's great you brought up BV because it's having a moment in the sphere at the moment. You've probably seen every time I go on Instagram, there's a new post about BV and I feel like there is a lot of misinformation about it. And so I just wanted to ask you a bunch of questions about it because I know a bunch of women do experience BV and it is something that quite a lot of women do experience. I saw a statistic the other day that said, you know, one in five women have BV, but only one of them will present with it. Um, so there is an element of BV that I am aware of that does it get passed from partner to partner like can it get passed from partner to partner like this is a, there is a little bit of an inkling of information about this that it, it can be transmitted yeah definitely so the the literature on partner transmission is controversial and I don't know why but over over time when you look at the literature of both fungal and bacterial infections of the genital urinary tract there seems to be a group that's like no this is entirely to do with the vagina and we don't need to even consider partners and then there's the other it's like hang on no this is clearly a microbe we interact anything i interact with in my environment be it yes. my dogs and cats and desks and chairs there's a microbial transference that comes yes. with that and and when we think about you know one microbiome site to another um, in terms of sexual interaction there is microbial microbial transference so with bv um what the terminology that we see in the literature that probably makes this a little bit easier to go, yes, there's a sexual aspect to it, is that it's a sexually enhanced disorder. And they use that terminology because you can have BV and have never had sex. So it's not dependent on having sex is the only way you can acquire BV-associated microbes. But then there are a lot of aspects of sexual interaction that put you at risk of sex as well, um, of BV, sorry. And, and they can be microbial transference. So there's some studies, more recent studies that show us for people that have um, male partners that the incidence of BV was predictable uh, from the microbiome makeup of their partner's penis. So from us, that tells us there's this very direct swapping of microbes that goes on. And there is other literature looking at one very specific BV microbe called Gardnerella that looks at that being shared between partners as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's important that there is a microbial sharing. So lots of people in my clinic were like, I didn't have this problem until I had this sexual interaction. Okay. And all of a sudden I have got problems every month. 
And so that does tell us that there's probably a number of things that went on and a microbial acquisition is part of that, but then there are environmental disturbers that also go on as well. Mm. And so, you know, the act of sex is littered with environmental disturbers in terms of fluid sharing and uh, tissue trauma associated with friction, which is also the pleasure point of sex. And all of these things mean that it might put you more at risk of BV if somebody was to introduce a bacteria that perhaps you've never had before and that your environment is not equipped to deal with or you have such an environmental shift at that time that it also allowed it some opportunity to mm. persist as well. So, right. yeah, outside you can have it just because your menstrual cycle is really heavy or you're a cigarette smoker or you've had antibiotics. Like there's lots of other reasons why you can end up with BV and a shift okay. in your vaginal microbiome. But sex seems to be a very big one and, you know, that most people will note very specific cause and effect. I think, yeah, that just speaks to a bit of shame that we still have around women's sexuality. Like, no, women don't have sex. Like, how, how, could, how could it be sexually transferred? Like, women don't do this thing. And it's like, yes, we do. <laughs> like, we are putting fingers and penises and tongues. And just as you said, like, there is always some type of transference with us and the microbiome of the vaginal canal. So I find that it is controversial, very bizarre. Very, very bizarre, but that's okay. Um, so just before I ask that question, I was supposed to ask another question. What is BV? Can you please tell us what it is exactly so we can understand? Because again, there's so much misinformation out there about what this condition is and what it, how it shows up in the, in the microbiome and what its symptoms are. Yeah, so BV is a very specific bacterial shift that occurs within the vagina microbiome and it's characterized if we again use that generalization about lactobacillus being the small mark of health it's characterized by a loss of lactobacillus and an overgrowth or an increase of a very specific subset of bacteria called anaerobes and and in that anaerobic group there are well-known ones like gardnerella but there are also other peripheral ones that join in. So BV is known as a polymicrobial infection. So it's not actually just one bacteria causing the issue. It's maybe it takes one bacteria to create the disturbance in the environment. And then the others are like, yeah, let's grow. The <laughs> environment is perfect. And so we end up with this complex condition where there are different bacteria contributing to the shift in the environment. So with the loss of lactobacillus and these overgrowths of anaerobes, we see uh, an increase of pH above 4.5. Um, characteristically with BV in the textbooks, we see a watery discharge that can be milky through to grey and quite gushy. And this is the one that has the very stigmatised odour of fish. Uh, and But the thing about that stigmatized odor, it's a very specific byproduct of very specific bacteria in that they produce these things called biogenic amines. Um, and they're the same things that we associate with rotting flesh and things like that. And these particular um, amines or proteins are only produced by some of these BV bacteria. So you could have BV wow. that doesn't have a very strong fishy smell or uh, it doesn't have a huge pH shift or it doesn't have classic characteristic gushy bacteria. And so it becomes very confused on what it is and how it is. Um, and BV is the most common uh, like genitourinary disturbance that we see. A lot of people think it's thrush, but thrush is actually the second most common presentation. And so there's all these people out there, particularly because we have in Australia uh, access to over-the-counter therapies for thrush. Any sort of discharge change, everyone will be like, oh, I've got thrush. Off I go to the pharmacy treating myself for thrush because it's sometimes again less stigmatized to ask for that over the counter and when in reality there's this being this bacterial shift that has occurred and it's a bv situation and so that also adds to the persistence of bv because a lot of people because there is this also link to lactobacillus and estrogens might find that their bv symptoms show up just before their period or just after their period and then they rectify as the estrogen comes up for the month and the lactobacillus gain a hold again, and then they drop in. So they're ebbing and flowing and sometimes not extreme and serious enough to go and access care all the time for as well. So we see this sort of, in my clinic, you know, quite chronic and recurrent BV patterns that can go on cyclical for long periods of time as well. Mm. Can you link together bv and po probably a lack of estrogen because it's not feeding the lactobacillus like is there a connection there yeah there is so i mean because 
lactobacillus has is very direct, big lifeline to estrogen. So that's why cyclically just before a bleed when estrogen takes its dive off the cliff and then just after a bleed where we've had also the input of blood itself, which is not acidic, so more alkali fluid. And then on the outside, just as estrogen is starting to pick up again, you'll see more BV symptoms just after a bleed. So there is that for people who menstruate. Interestingly, I mean, you can have BV in menopause, but in menopause we see a different type of environmental shift become more common, which is aerobic vaginitis. And um, so there is a relationship, and what I've seen in the literature, and it's well documented in the literature, but it is apparent for me clinically as well, is that BV tends to be a dysbiosis of people that have some level of estrogen. (laughs) And then the less estrogen, the less likely it is. And that's because there are other environmental shifts that go on as well in terms of how that environment is maintained. So, um, but yes, definitely direct links to estrogen. And clinically, that's often what I'm looking for is like, what's going on with your estrogen at this Mm -hmm. point? Like, why have you just not got enough that's optimal for you? Or is there something that we need to be modifying? Um, for you or are you on a contraceptive that means that your estrogen is just flatlined at that point right. um, all of those sort of things are worth exploring and, and and with that behavioral stuff as well people that are on a contraceptive are less likely to use a barrier method if they're engaging in intercourse and and so there's all the challenges that get piled on that mm. predisposition cool so that leads into my next question does the birth control pill or any type of contraception such as like copper iud's marina and the you know your probably your progesterone and your estrogenic estrogen and progestin birth control pills. How do they impact the vaginal microbiome and are those impacts positive or negative or like it's probably a lot of in between? Yeah, it is dependent upon the contraceptive and it can be dependent upon the individual as well. So we do have literature on it. It's not a huge body of literature, but um, with estrogen-containing contraceptives, typically it's thought to be protective to some degree, uh, at maintaining bacterial balance or eubiosis, whereas that very same estrogen content may be uh, an increased risk for candida. So candida, for example, also takes advantage of estrogen, but it uses it as a fuel to multiply itself. Mm -hmm. Um, So if it's got estrogen in it, you've got, you know, two things going on. It's protective against bacterial shifts, but riskier for sometimes for fungal issues. And then when we're looking at... um, Progestins or progesterone-only contraceptives, it's varied for individuals because those types of contraceptives can change people's bleeding in very different ways as well. So sometimes there comes an increased risk because there's less bleeding. Um, Sometimes if there's less, um, I clinically, and again, not well-defined in the literature, think that when people aren't menstruating or aren't having discharging of stuff, which happens often on those types of baseline, Um, then the microbiome is a little bit more challenged as well. Mm. Although the literature on progesterone only is uh, that it's a little bit neutral, like they're not necessarily seeing very negative shifts, but it depends on what's going on in the background as well. And then with IUDs, anything inserted carries risk, particularly for bacterial imbalance for individuals. Um, But it is you know, risk benefit. There's lots of reasons why people might need an IUD as well that could also predispose you to bacterial imbalance if we're looking at controlling mm-hmm. blood and bleeding and things like that. But it, it, when we have inserted devices, because they are a foreign object inserted into the environment, there is um, literature that suggests that bacteria will biofilm to that or cluster to that, a little bit like a maypole in the field, and, and with that becomes something that potentially makes it harder or more resistant to treatment if you are having treatment for it and why you can then have a recurrence afterwards. I'm kind of imagining it as, uh, you know, your copper IUD or, or your marina, whatever you have in there, is kind of like, have you ever seen those those coral, how they like re- rebuilding the coral in the Great Barrier Reef and they have these coral droves where they grow coral is it kind of like that where it kind of binds to this area and it kind of makes a home and that's why it might be a little bit harder for women who have intrauterine devices as contraceptive methods to get on top of their vaginal dysbiosis because there is this consistent biofilm on the IUD is that what you're suggesting yeah it's a bit like a reservoir I mean we have reservoirs of bacteria in general in recurrent infection but it can be a factor for some people and it is reported in the literature and I definitely know clinically people were like, I didn't have an issue until I got an IUD yeah. and and 
you know, then a little starter. But as I said, it does change behaviour as well to be on a contraceptive. Often people then move into relationships where they're not using barrier methods and, and there's more pH challenge and there's more microbial translocation and things like that. So it's never as simple as a simple factor. But in terms of working with people, I'm always flagging that if we don't see traction and we don't see change, then we may need to assess the fact that you have an IUD if it's something that you're wanting to stay at the moment. Um, And a lot of the time we do get change and everything's okay, but we're working with this, you know, peripheral area of how we can support an individual. And then sometimes particularly when it's very direct, I put that in and then I've had recurrent BV ever since and nothing sorting it. Having that removed does help the environment recover. So it's, I think it probably needs further research. There's a lot of these are clinical observations yeah. and, and there's lots of nuances to why it may or may not be appropriate to tell someone to take an IUD out or should you need to do that. But it is something to flag if you're noting very specific, I had this done and then this occurred um, because it is, you know, a foreign body. And with not just microbial reservoirs, there are immune system activation, you know, an, an irritant on a cellular level that can also aggravate and change the environment as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for that. So what would you recommend women do? So say I have had some weird discharge and there's a smell and the texture of my internal vaginal microbiome feels different to me. How do we go about testing for pH, testing microbiome? Who do we go to? And what are the challenges that you usually see women come to? And how can we stop women from interacting with those challenges and have basically an easier time finding out about what's going on with their nether regions, I would like to say, (laughs) because as you said before, sometimes, you know, when you have issues, it's just steeped with doctors who are like, just take an antimicrobial or take an antifungal without actually looking at what's going on. And as you said before, if you had candida and you're taking an antibacterial, it might not work because it's a yeast. So what can women do when they feel like something's wrong? What can females do when something's wrong? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a big believer that if you haven't had a swab, I'd start there. Like go and visit a GP, get a standard swab and culture and see what that says because culturable things you do need to know about and there are definitely, if it's a new symptom experience for you, there are peripheral things like SDIs that we need to consider as well. So I, I think start as a starting point, that is where I would always go. And if people come to me, and they haven't had a culture, then I would start there with them. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to look at the whole microbiome and do other testing if they want to, but there is a lot of information to be gathered from looking at cultures and swabs and past cultures and swabs and how the microbiome may have changed over time just from what the the sort of information that they do report. Um, I do acknowledge that lots of people's experience of that and treatment recommendations, particularly when they experience recurrency, is not, you know, pleasant or satisfactory for them. And so that tends to be the people that I am seeing, the ones that have tried everything, gone through everything, and then are still in a place where they're experiencing recurrent symptoms or they're being told that everything's normal, but that's not their experience of their body either. And so then we start to work on, you know, broader things. And so as individuals, you know, I would send somebody home with the guidelines around tracking their pH, like understanding how your vaginal environment changes in relation to your cycle, if you have one, is a very important way of being proactive and understanding of when we might apply treatment or when you might want to be more cautious with things or how you may want to interact with your environment as well. Mm -hmm. And pH tracking is very simple and very uh, cost effective. You know, you just need a pH paper that covers a range. Usually I use it anywhere that goes from zero to six or zero to seven in 0.5 increments um, and you're literally testing your cervical discharge or your vaginal discharge and reading the number and in health vaginal pH should be 4.5 and under which is a very acidic environment and shifts over 4.5 tell us that there is a bacterial change going on so it doesn't give us comment on candida or fungus just tells us the bacteria is shifting because they're the ones that contribute and control pH Mm -hmm. so that's something that you can do as well and as I said tracking that in relation to your cycle what cycle day are you what do we know about the hormones on that day is that an estrogen high or an estrogen low what did you do is that in relationship to uh, you know a sexual interaction or a fluid introduction or something that's going on as well so we can understand where risk points might be 
I think, um, you know, there's lots of, for, for me and, and working as a health clinician and seeing very complex disorders, I think often you do need the inside of a health practitioner to yes. be able to step back and look at it and go, well, we're looking at this. And you know what, if we only address this as a bacterial or a microbe biome issue, we're not going to get the traction we need than if we went deeper and went, well, your hormonal cycle is a bit dysregulated or your immune system is a little bit challenged or your sleep and nervous system cycle is impacting all of those things. And, you know, and, and diet and gut microbiome is, is important, although I find it's a very slow way to create change in this area. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's important for us as humans in health, but if you're only trying to modulate a vagina microbiome, via gut-based stuff, then it can be very slow to change and maybe unsatisfactory for you. But those sort of more holistic concepts around, you know, those very core areas are what you need to be modifying along with, you know, often there is a lot of emotional stuff layered on top of that in terms of interactions and how people perceive themselves to have interacted in a specific sexual scenario or, mm. and you know whether they're shaming themselves for that or like it's so layered and nuanced and associated with our life experience that taking time sometimes just to talk to people about that is also very liberating because there's a lot of internal stuff that goes on with people with shame and stigma societal and self and it means that people don't access care when they need it and it also means that perhaps they're not even just you know expressing what they need to be expressing in a setting because they're too shamed to say well actually I noticed that this happens like there's a lot of things that come out over time so having a relationship with a health practitioner over a period of time is very beneficial as well just to work through those things mm -hmm. in general um but a lot of it comes down to you know, if you're eating well and living well and sleeping well and taking care of your nervous system, there's going to be improvement. And then very practical things like, you know, using barrier methods if you're having sex and being aware of pH challenges and, you know, how you're washing and cleaning yourself like and what fabrics you might be using, which a lot of the time in recurrency, people have tweaked all of those things and they still have symptoms. <laughs> but if you haven't, it can be quite life-changing to move to bamboo underwear when you've been wearing synthetics or polyesters. Yes. Um, yeah, so those sort of things are important to still talk about with people as well. And then, you know, at a very basic level, a good quality women's health probiotic may provide you some benefit. It's not necessarily going to fix everything, <laughs> but for some people putting that in place and correcting lifestyle makes huge shifts for them because it's just a missing piece that's been happening for them. Mm -hmm. Great. So what will you usually say for treatment? I know... <laughs> your clinic spans quite a lot of different dysbiotic vag vaginal microbiomes. So, you know, you can't recommend any hard and fast rules and you just went through a few of them. What are some just general things women can do that if they just did all of them, that their vaginal microbiome health would probably benefit quite significantly? Like things like I, I've heard about lactobacillus crispitis, like suppositories, as well as boric acid suppositories. These things are very popular at the moment. And so what are your recommendations about a few of these things? Because I, I know a lot of people are just going, oh, there's something wrong. I'm just going to go on Google and get a boric acid suppository, but that might not be the right thing to do. So what are your general treatment things that women should try first before they go down the route of more specialized care? Yeah, I, I, for me, it tends to be those lifestyle things. I mean, I, I think that there is value and I do recommend intravaginal applications for both of those things clinically. But in my experience, without addressing the peripheral and systemic, all they are is symptomatic management. Mm -hmm. And so you will find that things will change, but come that time next cycle or next sexual interaction, you're back where you were because the factors that are actually creating that environment where those things are allowed to grow has not changed for you at all. Mm -hmm. And so the lifestyle stuff, which is dismissed and, again, not really well researched, is really important stuff for us to be making sure that we're on top of. Um, and then, you know, having those things and, and, you know, even just addressing our cycle or if you have got a swab and a culture and you want to go down the pharmaceutical route, which is completely okay. It's about the restoration of the microbiome and addressing the stuff afterwards. You know, if you've ended up with BV, which is a loss of lacto, what happened? Why? Why did that happen? And just because you've killed off the microbe that's driving the BV doesn't mean that you're guaranteed your lactobacillus will recover by itself. Like you need to be supporting that 
as well. And that can be, as I said, it can be using probiotics or using things like lactoferrin orally or, you know, looking at good prebiotic foods. But it can also be as simple as just letting that microbiome not be challenged for a period of time and, you know, taking out the fluid introduction of, you know, your partner and things like that. And um, so those things are more sustainable, I think, or, you know, lifestyle modifications like if you smoke, uh, people who smoke cigarettes, for example, are more prone to BV. They actually end up with some of those chemicals in the cervical fluid and they change the vaginal wow. microbiome. Yeah, which is huge for people that might use you know, nicotine in different ways recreationally as well. This is completely unrelated, but I found a study, I'll have to send it to you, on um, the connection between nicotine consumption for women and the clitoris shrinking. <laughs> because if it's a vasodilator, it's a vasoconstrictor. And so it makes sense that anything that you have in your diet that constricts the blood vessels is also going to constrict any nourishment that it gets into your vaginal microbiome. And you were talking about stress and even how we feel about, a vag about our vaginas before. And I think Naomi Wolf, if you've read her book, Vagina, she speaks about this a lot. And she talks about how the the thoughts and the beliefs and the the things that we think about ourselves and our vaginas can definitely impact our experience with it. I know women who have grown up in very religious households that have complete numbness and then they have all of this vaginal dysbiosis as well. And so can you speak to that as well? Like how our, you know, our nervous system innovation, and our beliefs and how we feel about our vaginas, how that can affect the actual physical dysbiosis that we could see or, or microbiome health that we see as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's probably something in the literature that's not studied on a molecular level, whereas our understanding from qualitative research, and my own included, is when we talk to people who have experienced recurrency in terms of issues and there is this very strong undercurrent of stigma and shame and how they feel about themselves that compounds the issue and certainly recreates barriers to change and recovery as well. And it is multifaceted. I mean, certainly I mentioned, you know, our upbringing and things like that, that you were just saying, you know, religious upbringing for an example, does shape how we view and retrospectively look back on experiences as well which may compound it i mean when we look at how our nervous system is innovated and what goes on with cortisol responses and how that can suppress an immune system and what goes on it, if we're looking at pleasure centers in terms of relaxation and blood supply that's important as well for immune systems and nutrition um and then when people have recurrent issues even without that stuff going on in the background if they are moving into something like a sexual interaction there is a constant state of worry, yeah. you know, and, and there is, a, even without sex, there's a constant state of worry. Like these people are hypervigilant. They are thinking about their vagina every day. If there's a gush, what was that? Oh, my gosh, do I smell? Can that person smell me? I'm interacting with a new partner. Do I tell them? Are they going to know? I don't want them to go down on me. Like there's all of this sort of internal stuff that goes on. And then even in people that have, um, you know, uh monogamous and have a, a single partner and that they're interacting with that may have understanding of that it doesn't mean that they're not you know they go into that interaction hopefully from a place of love but at the same time there is still a nervous system chatter that's like oh gosh after this I'm gonna have to get up and have a shower and make sure that I'm all clean and then take these things and I hope I don't get BV or I hope I don't get thrush or I hope I don't get a UTI which completely overrides any joy or pleasure that we could be deriving from yeah. that experience. And yeah. so it becomes this very big cycle because at the same time you tense up. When you tense up, your pelvic floor is tense. Then the, the pelvic floor that's tense might mean there's less, I mean, there's more tissue trauma or more pain response. Or like it's, it's so multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And at the core of us as humans that have obviously nervous systems and experiences of the outside world, we would hope that harmony and joy and pleasure are uh, big goals. I mean, I always talk to my clients about where's the joy in your life? What are you doing that's yeah. pleasurable for you? What can we do that will bring that back? Because at the same time, you know, you've got all of these things that are what ifs and worries that are impacting your vagina health as well. And I, I often will note when I talk to people that I know you're getting better or you'll know you're getting better when you realise you haven't checked in with yourself. Like if I forgot you had a vagina, like that's the ultimate <laughs> shift into wellness like I didn't even think about it this week it's amazing um you know and unless I absolutely needed to because I was thinking I might have sex you know those sorts of things are important but it is 
there's lots of I think that we can't look at on a on a scientific level because it is dealing with our emotional traits and our histories and what that means for us and how we interpret situations as well. Mm. I'd like to move on to treatments, and again, this is quite broad, but specifically I'd like to talk about ones that I've found on the internet and your opinion on them. So I've seen some pretty crazy ones, and someone even commented on one of my Instagram posts recently saying, you know, my my grandmother used to put half a lemon in her vagina. Um, I've seen Greek yogurt used as a suppository and even yoni steams to heal so things like chronic BV. So what's your opinion on these things and how can we research before we try them out and like what what's your recommendation around them? Because I see a lot of, again, a lot of misinformation online about what to do in these situations. Yeah, um, gosh, I know that people have very strong opinions on all three of those things that you've mentioned. And when you do go into the literature, because I like to go and see, there are people that have looked at the application of yoga in addressing candida and bacterial shifts and there is efficacy there it's probably not as efficient and fast as doing other things but in my opinion if you have woken up with thrush and it's midnight on a saturday and you can't get to the pharmacy till the next day and you've got greek yogurt it's going to cool things down and you're introducing lactobacillus it's not the worst thing in the world there's a really interesting study using um, yogurt and honey in pregnancy with quite good outcomes as well for thrush. So it's not that they're without evidence. It's obviously not broadly studied. And when we're we're existing in a world of scientific robustness, you have to have lots of things that are replicated and studied that as well. And therein lies the issue. But there are lots of people who will swear that that works for them. And, you know, if we're looking at, I mean, there is research on probiotic insertions and even in systematic review and meta-analysis, the outcome of that is that these are very promising, but we don't have enough research that is the same to comment on whether it's going to be successful for everybody. And so we don't then have a comparison between using a yogurt and using a probiotic because even the probiotic research is not robust enough to make huge sweeping conclusions around. But I wouldn't dismiss it. You know, it's not clinically for me, not going to be something that I prescribe to people. But if they are using it and they're finding it effective, I'm not going to take it away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I, people who that works for don't get to come see me because they don't need to see me. So I think that that's also, you know, there's the perspective on it. Some people have who really have a thrush infection and it's a once-off, may be able to apply that and it would work for them and soothe things and cool things down and that would be okay mm-hmm. and off they go, yeah. So it's not without evidence. I mean, the same with lemon juice. There is a lemon juice study as well. They were looking at because it's an acidifier and it's got citric acid in it and how that could impact um, in BV, I think the study is. And there were shifts. Again, not enough that I would say let's use lemon juice, but the application of acids within vaginal health is something that has a variety of literature on. So it's probably not up there with must-do for me. (laughs) I think they were using lemon juice as an irrigation, like a douche in and out. And, yeah, yeah, so it's probably, but it's not the theory, you know, in terms of pH is there, but it's Mm -hmm. probably not what I would condone people continue to use. And the same with yoni steaming. Yoni steaming is one of those things. I've been asked a lot about yoni steaming and I have looked at the literature on it and, again, it's, you know, I, I get that it's touted as being thousands of years of ancient tradition and that is important. But at the same time, some of the claims in that area, I think, are a little bit extreme and far out. But, yes. Yeah. But there is lots of benefits from improving blood supply to the pelvis and what does the application of heat do? You know, why do we put a heat pack on when we've got pain? And for me, that is where yoni steaming sits, is in like what it's an application of medicinal herbs and heat in a situation that is characterized perhaps by congestion or pain or, you know, in a very Chinese medicine sense, like a stagnation type mm-hmm. situation. And so I don't prescribe yoni steaming and not you know, in any way educated in it other than the periphery. But I will give people heat packs for their vulva. And, you know, we'll talk about for people that have that sort of pelvic um, tension and pain situation, that putting a heat pack on daily, regardless of whether you've got pain, is a nice application because it encourages blood supply. And with that comes an immune response. And with that comes, blood, you know, nutrition in the blood. And so I think that urine steaming is in there and, and, and the application of medicinal herbs, through external, um, you know, topical application 
is again a very traditional practice that has benefits and so they are all things that have merit but perhaps in my opinion for the chronicity of what we are seeing in this space like I, I was talking to somebody the other day about this on on an ecological level what has gone on that in the last seven years of my practice the extremes of bacterial vaginosis that I'm seeing and how many people are saying that they have it has just exponentially increased and I get that I'm attracting people but at the same time there's more awareness and it's there and and is that a reflection of contraceptions and antibiotics and our ecosystem etc or are there other things going on that we're not you know not really necessarily looking at in terms of environmental um, control as well but so those sort of practices are lovely like you know is lovely self-care practice but it may not be enough to pull somebody out of a recurrent picture when there is hormonal and nervous system and other facets to it as well. Right. So these are, I feel something happening right now, I can nip it in the bud situation. It's almost like taking echinacea when you're getting sick versus taking it when you have a full-blown flu. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like this isn't, gonna, this isn't going to deal with a huge dysbiotic problem. It can be good if you already have a really healthy vaginal microbiome and you can pull things back and restabilize it very quickly with a you know an alternative and more natural treatment to avoid going into you know having to go in, in to see someone like you and having full-blown bac- bacterial vag- vaginosis and things like that potentially yes and 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 sometimes like within the case of your own steaming maybe just a self-care practice of connection and you know acknowledgement and warmth and you know that's a very yin thing to be doing and i think that that's okay as well but i i don't see that for the type of conditions that i am seeing clinically mm. as a curative thing it would be, have to be so much more multifaceted to it but self-care for all those reasons we just talked about with nervous system health is an important thing to have going and if that makes you feel good and you get five minutes away from everybody to sit on a throne and be warm and you know <laughs> nourished i think that that's okay as well <laughs> Beautiful. So what do you usually do in your clinic? So say I present to your clinic, is, are you giving me something to take internally, like a, some type of probiotic? We're changing diet and exercise. Are we doing suppositories and possibly creams and topical solutions as well? Like are you looking at the entire sphere of how, how we can kind of solve this holistic issue in a holistic way or do you prefer one over the other? Or like what are your treatment preferences and what are some recommendations you could give for women? Yeah, it is a combination. So usually I'm asking people to test their microbiome. We're getting some insight into exactly what it is that we are needing to look at and correct. And then through case taking, like an initial consult is an hour, then we go through all of those systems that have relevance that we need also to be addressing. And so the combination is I usually have some treatment aims that are more systemic and background, like we're going to work on this on your hormones or test this and address this and work on this nutritional factor and make sure your nervous system is corrected and, you know, that your gut is working. And then on a very local level, which is dependent upon the type of symptoms and the level of inflammation that somebody is having, there will be different things that I might recommend intravaginally. This is a microbiome we can touch, so let's touch it. You're going to get faster results to acute symptom change if you're able to modify things at a very local level. And so that might include for people that don't have high levels of inflammation, it might include um, very low volumes of fluids with herbs in them or herbal creams. Um, There might be probiotic uh, pessaries that we want to introduce or pre and probiotic pessaries that we might want to introduce. Or sometimes inflammation is so high that you can't do anything internally initially. You just sort of want to get somebody in a sitz bath or spritzing some fluid on them and while you work a little bit harder in the background to shift things or you might be complementing standard care, you know, pharmaceutical care to get symptom relief and then we're at a point where, gosh, we want to recover this microbiome so it doesn't continue for you. So it's very much individualised as good holistic medicine is and um, and with that, you know, there's, there's not a specific, this is the magical cream for... BV, like it, it for me, it comes down to, gosh, there's that microbe and it will respond to this particular herb. And so we'll put some of that in. And you need a lot of, you've got a lot of inflammation by the looks of it. Let's put some anti inflammatory in there. And your inflammation seems to be very much allergic driven. So let's have something that works on histamine responses. And mm. So it, it, you know, becomes very individualized in that sense as well. And so there's a variety of 
different ways and and it also comes down to what somebody is comfortable with some people don't want to insert things some people can't because of pain disorders like vaginismus or vulvodynia and so it all is very much open for discussion and dictated by the individual and that sort of will mean how fast we can progress or how slow and sometimes it is a long process this is for me I work with people over a minimum of three months to sometimes a couple of years to get things back to where they need to be and and that sounds extreme but sometimes I see people who have BV every day of their life and have done for five years you know and so and have tried all the other things so they're coming to me with like I have tried everything (laughs) okay (laughs) we need to rethink what we're doing here and so timelines are extended I work with people on monthly cycles because if they have a menstrual cycle that hormonal rhythm is important as well to see change or they may only be flaring at a particular point in a cycle anyway so we're waiting for that point to come and go to apply a treatment preventatively or to make sure that they don't have a symptom flare and if we're looking at it in a very reductionist view and only on a microbiome level the longer you hold a microbiome stable where it doesn't have a fluctuation into disorder, the more likely it is to sort its own stuff out. So Mm -hmm. it's about holding it and allowing it to recover because you can't put probiotics in and expect them to colonise. They're in there to modify the environment to let your own microbiome recover. And then once you stop using a probiotic, everything sort of disappears. So you're only left with what you've got uh, Mm -hmm. initially anyway. So finding out exactly what's going on hormonally, and in the microbiome acting and then letting it sort itself out. I think that's such a beautiful way of looking at it and then rechecking and rehaving a look. Okay, let's just adjust again and then, okay, you're good to go. And I think that's the thing that we're obsessed with in this Western world, um, especially in health and wellness, is because we're constantly looking for something to fix. And I think if anything is, you know, off counter with, you know, <laughs> vaginal microbiome, women will always be like, oh, what's going on? Like something's very, very wrong here. There's something that needs to be fixed immediately. And then they go and look and go, okay, I need to get a boric acid suppository. I need to find something online because it needs to be fixed immediately. So I think that approach is really beautiful just to be like, nope, this can fix itself. Let's just get it to a point where it can. So thank you so much. And you educate practitioners as well would you like to speak a little bit about that because I know you have an incredible program that you do six months of the year yeah I have a, um, a program it's called Vagiversity which is six months of practitioner education um, mentoring and lecturing so we meet twice a month every month for six months and it's uh, open to a range of practitioners I've had obviously have a lot of naturopaths and nutritionists join the course, but I have had gynecologists and GPs, pelvic physiotherapists, acupuncturists who are coming in just because there is a deficit of knowledge in understanding this area on a holistic level and a very a lot of frustration of not getting the change that we see from the current um, you know, options that we have available for treatment. So that runs twice a year um, as a live program and then with things on replay if you don't make the live. And then I run a variety of short webinars through the year. So I've got one coming up on the um, penile and seminal microbiome. There'll be one later in the year around the endometrial microbiome. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working with that and, and then running a clinical practice as well where I see people face-to-face to help them with these conditions. Great. And where can people find you and book in with you if they want to find you? Yeah, so I have a website, which is intimateecology.com.au and also on Instagram, and you'll find links to booking there. My book's open again uh, March 21 for new client bookings, so I tend to um, take new clients in quarters, otherwise things get a little bit hectic. And I have some new practitioners on my team as well, so working in different areas of genitourinary health so that we can cover a bigger array so that's March 21st that's opening but yeah checking out socials where I post a lot of information general information for both health practitioners and for the public as well and um, yeah all those links are there under intimate ecology cool well thank you so much I really appreciate your time 